40% Merlot, 40% Oh, Welcome to the Wine Enthusiast Podcast, the world in your glass. Interested in breaking news from the wine, beer, and spirits industries? Read the new, free, multimedia information news hub, Beverage Industry Enthusiast. Written and produced with a fresh point of view, BIE is your go-to online destination for the trade. You'll meet the people who power the industry, watch exclusive videos with industry professionals, and receive a weekly news email. Sign up now at winemag.com forward slash BIE. Jamison Fink, Senior Digital Editor, Wine Enthusiast Magazine. So wine education can be a big undertaking. It involves understanding and memorizing information on everything from geology, anthropology, analogy, uh, sociology, really almost any ology you can think of. And um, in, in my perspective, in my case, not to mention uh, the, the dread and anxiety that comes from blind tasting, uh, trying to master it, not even master it, just alone understand it and, and make it something useful for you and not beating yourself up too much when it goes wrong. And uh, the other thing about studying for wine is that often uh, you're doing it all alone. You're by yourself. You've got books supplied by maybe a um, Wine and Spirits Education Trust, the WSET, as we like to say, or the Court of Master Sommeliers. Um, so this week I wanted to talk to two students of wine who are preparing for different levels of wine studies, um, as well as a teacher to uh, someone from the Northwest Wine Academy in Seattle, Washington. That would be Ezra. I wanted to hear what their wine education has been like, what their experience, and you know, for Ezra, who's an instructor, how or, or what a wine academy teaches differently than what you get from studying alone, if there's sort of safety in numbers. Ezra, while at a busy cafe in Capitol Hill, Seattle, uh, my old neighborhood, explain what the Northwest Wine Academy does. I'm Ezra Wicks. I am uh, an instructor at Northwest Wine Academy. I teach sommelier sales and service and beverage program management and sensory evaluation, soon to be advanced sensory evaluation as well in in, uh, winter quarter next year. And I also am the wine director of uh, Osteria La Spiga in Seattle as well. I am the sommelier at Bar Ferdinand. And I own a company that does consultation and private cellar building called Digby. The Northwest Wine Academy is unique and it sort of stemmed off from the culinary arts program at South Seattle Community College. They built their own building about 10 years ago. Uh, and so it's a full it's a full service facility with a kitchen that does like food and wine pairings and there's rooms for blind tasting. There's also a winery production. So you can do certificates in wine marketing sales, food and wine pairing. You can you can get an associate's degree in enology, making your own wine. And there's a lot of famous uh, Washington producers who have uh, graduated from the program. Lobo Hills is one. Um, uh, Savage Grace is another. There's a bunch of people who've trained there. Um, as far as the curriculum goes, I teach sommelier sales and service and beverage program management, which is a course that I designed, which is about training your palate and blind tasting wines and getting to know the characteristics of, of wines that are considered classic by the Wine and Spirits Education Trust uh, and by the Quarter Master Sommeliers. Um, also, I teach sensory evaluation, which is all about honing your your specific memories for for varieties and for grapes in general really sort of expounding on on the characteristics of wine you know and what really triggers things for you which is a big part of blind tasting for the quartermaster sommeliers uh as far as getting to the point where like like i'm w set uh advanced level three i'm also advanced sommelier with the quartermaster sommeliers so i'm basically training for the master sommelier diploma which i mean was you know uh what that song movie was all about and and all that um, and I think it, it just takes a lot of perseverance to, once you get to the higher echelon about, about really digging in on the minutia of all of it and training your palate and always keeping up on everything because the wine world changes and you also have to practice. Practice makes perfect really in the sommelier profession more than anything. Um, you can't just like let it go and expect that it's going to be like riding a bike. You have to constantly do it. 
So the Wine Academy can give you a good base for the WSAT and other tests, but what exactly are those tests and what makes them different? When I spoke with WSAT students Chris and Marshall, I asked them and also Ezra to explain that. Marshall Tilden, Director of Sales. So my first stint was in, uh, or my beginnings were 2011 with the Advanced Program. Uh, they have beginning and intermediate, but uh, there's like a entry exam you can kind of take to see if you need those uh, others. And I was uh, educated enough at that point to start at the Advanced. So that was 2011, six years ago, seven years ago. Yeah. Hi, I'm Christian Welch. I'm an Enology student and um, a level two WSET completion person. <laughs> So the WSET is uh, the Wine and Spirits Education Trust, and it's um, one of about three certification courses you can do in the wine world. Um, the one people tend to know about is the Court of Master Sommeliers. This one is, I think, a little better. <laughs> the WSET um, Level 3 is it's the precursor to the WSET Diploma, which is six units of very comprehensive knowledge of beverages in general, the entire world. It takes a couple of years to complete, and that one's really hard. And that sort of, that it, once you get the WSET Diploma, then you're eligible to, to go and um, study at the Institute of Masters of Wine, which is the basically the holy grail of like certifications for wine. The WSET 3 is this sort of intermediate um, overall general knowledge of wine. And the one and two leading up to it uh, sort of are introducing you to the WSET 3. You don't necessarily need to take one and two to go into WSET 3. Um, they recommend it because they're sort of building your knowledge along the way. But WSET 3, I mean, you basically have to have a general idea of wine production, grapes, um, and basic history for every wine producing area of the entire world. And then you have to have developed your palate enough to be able to use their, their tasting grid to determine, uh, at the end of uh, the exam, determine a couple different wines, like two reds and two whites or something like that. For the Corte Sommeliers, there's four levels. The first level being a couple days of, um, of theory seminars and no blind tasting or anything like that. And it's very like, they, they teach you everything in those couple of days that you need to know to pass the exam, which is something like an 80 or 90% uh, pass rate. The certified sommelier exam, which is level two for the quarter match sommeliers, is more intense and you really sort of have to have a grasp on service. You have to be comfortable talking to people and opening wine and pouring wine and following their mechanics of service is what they call it. You know, walking around the table clockwise and pouring women before men and how, you you know, carrying a tray, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when you get up into the third level for the quarter match sommeliers, it gets really intense. Um, and you have to be able to blind taste uh, and call down to the grape and vintage six wines in 25 minutes. Um, the, the exam's done over three days. Uh, and, at, you know, the, the theoretical knowledge is, is a pretty high bar for that one, only really exceeded by the Master Sommelier Diploma, which is the same type of structure as the advanced one. It's just, you know, tenfold, essentially. Yeah, so uh, especially when you get to you know the diploma level, it's 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 spread out in different sections. You know, there's six different sections, and uh, one of the sections is is business of wine. So uh, the the W set really separates itself from say the uh, Psalms, the Master Psalms, where there's service, right, and uh, and that end of it. So getting into the business side of um, you know how wine is marketed, uh, what are the trends in the market, and and how is the you know wine business world affected, and what can be done to uh, go, you know, work with those those trends is, is something that's not a lot of people realize is part of that program. Uh, but much of it is the examination of wines and all kind of wine. You know, there's there's sections alone that were on um, fortified wines. So one of the most you know difficult parts was sitting through a, a whole bunch of really high alcohol, sticky sweet wines and having to determine varietal and, and location and, and, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. I think uh, the sommelier course is, is very helpful for people that want to do a career in wine and restaurants. It does a lot more with food pairing um, and blind tasting. Um, as somebody who wants to be making wine, WSET does a little bit more of the process of um, fermentation, does a little bit more vineyard work. Um, there's also another one called the uh, Certified Sellers of Wine course, and they tend to do a lot more in the marketing realm. But... Um, I like this one. It's pretty well-rounded. 
I've taken a few classes too in order to get a better understanding of wine tasting and I certainly enjoyed them. It gave me an opportunity to taste a whole ton of wines that as a single dude on my own I could never buy and uh, and, and just try. It would be just way too much money and uh, uh, way too much, not effort, but uh, it's sort of a Herculean task to get 10 bottles of Beaujolais and try all the crews and uh, spend all that money and then open all those bottles. and. Look, I was a single dude living in Chicago. How am I get like? I want to carry a case of wine on the subway, and when it's a hundred degrees out, so it's a blessing uh, just for the logistics part of it too. And you know, it's a great way uh, to learn how to uh, to learn about wine too, and distinguish different you know notes and flavors, and understand regions and grapes. But it's a long, complicated process. So I'm wondering what kind of person you know wants to undertake this and become the student to pursue certain diplomas in WSET. Is there a, a personality that uh, is more drawn to that process, uh, you know, sort of like type A go-getter or a brooding intellectual like myself or a little bit of both? Or are you a nerd, a geek? Are you a little crazy or all of the above? It's a real rabbit hole kind of thing. Um, people tend to, from what I've seen, uh, one t- tends to be people's second career. Um, I meet a lot of like English majors, a lot of librarians, a lot of lawyers who get burnt out um, and they really end up delving into wine because it's something that nerdy people can kind of latch on to. There's a little bit of geology in it. You've got to learn about different soil styles. There's some like uh, anthropology where you learn about different cultures and different uh, countries. There's chemistry where you learn about different compounds that go into wine. And it's something that people that um, have a very, we'll call it an active brain, tend to latch on to really well. The cool thing about the curriculum and the, the program at North uh, South Seattle Community College is that uh, there's people from all walks of life. I've taught people who are just turned 21. I've taught people who are in restaurants and want to learn more about wine. And, you know, the restaurants are paying for their way to go out there and learn about them. I've also taught people who are retired and interested in doing something different. I mean, the more you learn about wine, though, the more uh, you realize that that you're, you're not really learning enough. I mean, because the wine world's constantly changing and there's so much minutia. And so you really have to have a passion for everything. Like, you know, you have to be really into history, geology, to a certain degree, agriculture, obviously food and wine, gastronomy and things like that. But I mean, you can't just be like, oh, I just like wine. You have to be like, I like all those things and really, really go go deep into it to to get to the point where you've mastered it sort of, you know. I kept asking questions and I was just always asking people questions, you know, uh, how is this made? Uh, why is it made in that way? And, uh, and what are you doing during the process to get it there? And uh, it went from simple questions to more in-depth questions to where some people didn't have the answers anymore. And so I just kind of had a thirst for knowledge. And that's just the way I'm kind of built, like just wanting to know more. So that was just part of myself. And then the other is that, you know, you find in the industry that there's a lot of people that um, know things and think they know things. And I kind of needed to find out things for myself. The deeper I would start to do a dig on things, the more I found out uh, not everyone knew quite as much as they uh, may have claimed they did. And so it just was an extremely um, interesting concept to me, you know, just what goes into not only making these wines, but marketing of these wines and, and the business itself. And so the uh, the more I learned, the more uh, it excited me and the, the more I enjoyed it. So a big part of these exams is blind tasting. Uh, what a wine is, what grape it is, where is it from, uh, is it an old or new wine, is it, um, how is it made, does it have oak, does it not have oak, is it high in alcohol, is it low in alcohol, uh, the list goes on and on and on, there's actually a, a, a list for it, it's called, a, it's a grid, it's a tasting grid that you have to do, and you have to discern all this from, look, you don't get the whole bottle to try for hours, you, you get a glass, and you have to be conscientious with your sips and your time, because you're on the clock, so, does practicing blind tasting, though, I'm wondering, you know, like as myself, does that uh, does it change your palate? Maybe not just your palate, too, but can you sort of turn that on and off and be like, uh, I'm just going to drink this wine. I'm just going to enjoy it. My brain is going off. I'm going to drink this wine. I'm not going to go, oh, color, uh, clarity, uh, uh, straw, pale straw, yell, Gah! and start um, freaking yourself out. So. You know how does how does that blind tasting like I said does it uh, does it change you as a wine drinker or, or does it enhance your skills and tastings uh, that you're already there are, are you born with it um, or are, is it something that you you practice and you learn and it's like that kind of Malcolm Gladwell ten thousand hour thing. I think that definitely your palate changes a lot over time. Initially, most people start out with this like palate for 
really uh, rich, dark reds. But the more you drink wine, the more you taste, uh, especially buying for a restaurant, your palate sort of tends toward this uh, like lighter, more more uh, sharp, acidic profile because you you get palate fatigue and you get tired of that like intensity. It's kind of a conversation to have about the vernacular of wine. Um, in the English language, we don't really have a way to say, oh, this tastes like um, stewed mushrooms, stewed tomatoes, or this tastes like ginger. When you when you pop open a Gewürztraminer from Alsace, you, you smell a lot of ginger and a lot of chalk, and we kind of have to steal the language from other places and in the language to be able to talk about it. Um, that's how you remember it, that's how you can recommend it to people, and that's how you can blind taste and pick things out. Um, it's kind of, I think that's a lot of the reason why wine comes off as pretentious, <laughs> because we steal this language and verbiage from other people. Um, as far as your palate is concerned, it's just familiarity. There's so many different variables and so many different options. Um, and when you're first getting into it, you're presented with all of those with little context, and you kind of just have to take a stab in the dark. With blind tasting sp specifically, it's a little bit more like a like a soccer game than a basketball game. It's not a very high-scoring thing. The best blind tasters, the best level three psalms, get it right about 60% of the time, and that's a really daunting thing. Um, but the more that you study, the more that you learn about it, the more context you have, and the more you can say... I think this is a Merlot. I get a really purple vibe off of it. I get a lot of blackberries and cherries, and and I, there's some fruitcake aspect to it, so it's probably a warmer climate Merlot. I never would have been exposed to that before. And it's just taking little bits of information that you pick up along the way and applying it in a high-pressure scenario. <laughs> I think it's pretty clear that, that blind tasting for me is, frankly, terrifying and anxiety-inducing because of all the... Mostly because of all, like, the second-guessing I've done. Like, ooh, I know this is... Uh, you know, Chablis, and then I'm like, ah, maybe it's Sancerre, or maybe it's this, or maybe it's that. And then I talk myself out of it, and I go in a circle, and I don't go with my gut, which is, I, I tend to go with my gut. I think that's that's just the way I operate. I'm not sort of a, as clinical. I just I just go with, like, I smell it, I taste it, I'm like, this is what it is, boom. And, um, you know, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But um, obviously, there's uh, other schools of thought on that. There are literally schools of thought on that. So, um, I wanted to ask Chris, the newest student, to undertake a blind tasting for me uh, for this podcast because I am a monster. And so in a quiet space in Seattle's Hotel Andra, uh, I had our producer Tina pull out a carafe of white wine, pour some for him, and, um, and wish him luck. But before I started, um, I wanted both Chris and Marshall to chime in on is uh, one type of wine easier to taste than the other, uh, you know, like white or red, and just to break it down to the most obvious difference, so white yeah um just because you'd run into different characteristics um chardonnay is never going to smell like uh a riesling a a sauvignon blanc is never going to smell like a, a chenin blanc um whereas with red merlot cabernet syrah since so malbec they all kind of start with the same words and you can delve into it a little more Personally, and, and you might get different, yeah. you know, answers. I, I find whites harder. Um, they're, I don't want to be general, but if we're being general, yeah, uh, sure. right, they're, they're not as intense. Um, it's hard for them to be as complex because they don't have tannins and they usually don't have as much oak. Oh, those are those are fighting words for white wine lovers. I know, I know. That's what I say. It's general. Well, the gloves general. are off. <laughs> <laughs> but you're yeah. looking at, you know, you're looking at what can separate different wines. So just take like the, I, I keep going back to Shannon Riesling because right. it is my, like you said, it's my nightmare uh, miss on the test. Um, you know, how similar those can be because they're made in similar styles because the grapes have similarities. And if you want to make one like the other, you certainly can. Um, where it comes to red wines, even, you know, lighter Pinots, whatever it is, uh, they have tannins. They have some sort of oak. Do they have new oak? They have old oak. And, uh, you know, when you have a whole bunch of white wines that are aged and stainless across the board, they're all going to have some sort of similar character characteristic to some degree. You know, maybe it's a city or, or, or the finish or the, you know, that crispness on the, uh, on the back end. So I find reds a little uh, more distinct or easier to distinguish in a blind than whites. Uh, you know, that being said, I think whites are easier to uh, separate in terms of their age. As Chris begins tasting this wine, 
Marshall talks about what he goes through when, you know, you just you just can't go with your gut or your gut is empty or your gut is being like, I need help. You got to try harder than this. So uh, it's all about the tasting grid in that case. So Chris, as a good student, as a good wine student that he is, came prepared and pulled out his copy of the grid. The grid. I have the nose. I have some idea. I have the palate. It kind of changes my idea from the nose. And then I'm not quite, you know, sure where to go. And then you have, and that's where the grid comes in. This uh, systematic approach to tasting wine. So for blind tastings, you go top to bottom. You start with the appearance, clarity, intensity, color. From there, you go onto the nose. Um, you check for faults. You get into some aroma characteristics, which are here listed on the back. It goes anywhere from floral stuff like blossoms and roses to dried fruits like fig, prune. There's vegetable stuff like cabbage and beans, uh, I, everything, oak, yeast, buttery biscuit kind of things. Um, yeah, anything that can help you narrow it down a little bit. It's like a safety net in, in ways, right? I'm not sure. All right, let's go back to basics. You know, what are the, you know, what are the characteristics? What's the intensity? What's the flavor? What's the aroma? What's the alcohol? What's the tannin? What's the acid? All that kind of stuff. And then it gets you to where you can at least limit down to a few different um, regions. Okay, so the first step is um, the appearance is the very first thing. You'll swirl it in the glass a little bit to release the aromatics. Um, but before you even put your nose in, before you start tasting it, the very first thing is to look and see how it strikes you. For whites, uh, I think color is really overlooked. You know, reds is, there's color differences between Pinot and, and Merlot and, and, and Cab and bigger wines, but you know, you can really gauge, especially age, uh, with color on, on whites so much between the, you know, the, uh, the yellows and the, the golds and the ambers and how much age they have on them. And um, So looking past color, I think, is a mistake a lot of people do. And with almost every wine, I'll try and find a white piece of paper, you know, to see if I can see through it. Is it opaque? Is it clear? You know. Okay, so now um, I'm holding the wine up against a white piece of paper. It's good to do that. Uh, a lot of natural light is good when you're blind tasting. And uh, yeah, we like a, a white background so that you can be able to tell. It's appearing very clear. There's some slight bubble to it. The bubbles are very, very faint, but they're there. Um, yeah, no fault, it appears. I'd call this one very pale in clarity. And uh, on the visual side of the spectrum, a hazy wine will mean that it might be too old. Uh, there might be some court taint that was involved in it. Uh, it could just mean that the wine is unfiltered, which is not a fault. Uh, and it's really just to mess with you. But <laughs> this one doesn't have that at all. It's very clear, a lemon in color. There's some green tint to the yellow. Um, yeah, so let's, I'm going to put my nose in it now. First thing I do is judge intensity because when your first thing you do on a nose is intensity. Is it, you know, medium, medium, minus, medium plus. You know, the biggest pitfall in any blind tasting, as you know, is the jump to conclusion, right? You, you smell something and I smell grapefruit. Well, it has to be Sauvignon Blanc, right? And that's like the worst thing to do because you want to go through all the examination to give yourself at least a few choices of what it could be based on the characteristics. Let's see, no court taint yet again. It's clean, um, sort of a medium pronounced uh, aroma. Gonna get a lot of peach. Um, there's some citrus in there. Some, uh, yeah, some some lemon peel or lime peel. Yeah, it smells uh, almost spritzy, almost like a sprite. Yeah, I guess nothing left but to taste. And the thing that Chris is doing now, I mean, he's he's uh, he's not drinking the wine. You know, he's tasting. He's swishing it around in his mouth. He's trying to aerate it to get uh, you know the aromas and the, the and, and uh, switching it around in your mouth, getting it to hit every part of your tongue. And your in your mouth, so you can really uh, try and pull out as many flavors. You use use all the tools that you got. Okay. Well, again, very clean one. Nothing bad with it. Um, the flavor is again kind of a medium pronounced. You don't have to really search for it, but it's not kicking you in the teeth. Um, much of the same kind of explanation on the palate. You're going to get some peach. Um, Lots of green flavors. I would go more lime than lemon on it for sure. Um, yeah, very green. Um, very refreshing wine. This one's got a little bit of sweetness. I would call it off dry, not dry. This one's going to be a Riesling. Um, I'm pretty sure it's a Riesling. Yeah. <laughs> I love me some Riesling. It's hard, it's hard to say no. I'm going to go young again. There's lots of vibrancy. Riesling is one of the varietals that, because of the acidity level, it can age for decades. Um, it gets a lot of a bad rap because it's kind of a sweet wine and it's one that people who don't really drink wine can get into very easily. But the aging ability of it is, is just incredible. Um, this one I don't think has gotten there yet, though. This one's going to be a little newer. Um, 
And then I kind of try and get a feel of old world or new world, right? Is it a old world wine in terms of feel of more secondary characteristics, more oak, more nutty, uh, you know, even aged with tertiary mushrooms, things like that? Or is this a wine that's new world, uh, going for fresh fruit and, you know, brightness and, and new oak and kind of thing? It's so green, I almost want to go Australia, but I think I would confidently say new world. So Australia, New Zealand, West Coast, maybe even South Africa. I don't think it's German. It's a definitely a younger one. I'm going to go 15 on this. All right, with Chris's guests ready, our producer Tina presented the bottle of wine, pulling it out of its paper bag. All right. Shall we? This is a... It's Riesling! <laughs> All right, so you got that. Bam. <laughs> yeah. It is a 2015 Riesling. It is from Washington State. This is also Chateau Saint Michel. Ah, man, Chateau Saint Michel, doing good work this morning. <laughs> So that was just a simple test between pals, something I've done on numerous occasions, you know, like stump the wine expert, stump the geek. But, um, you know, even as Chris started tasting the wine and talking about its qualities, you know, I was like, I felt like, uh, I don't know, like a soccer dad or something. I was like, I wish you would score a goal. I'm so nervous for you or an assist or, oh, I'm just, I'm just glad you're out here trying, son. I'm really, uh, I'm really happy for you. It's, you know, it's about, uh, it's about the journey, not the destination, et cetera. Um. And just to do it one-on-one is one thing, but to do it in front of, like, a panel or a crowd is is another thing. Um, It's really, uh, you know, intimidating, and uh, you can freak out easily, especially if you're myself who's prone to um, freaking out. Freaking out on the inside. It won't manifest itself uh, outwardly, but there's a lot of emotional turmoil. I promise you. I promise you. And that's just me just kind of, like, you know, having fun with my my buddies, my wine buddies, and uh, drinking wine. But, you know, uh, some of these folks studying are taking these you know very rigorous grueling tests and they're preparing for it months and months in advance and so i just was wondering like hey you know like i'm a bachelor dude i got all the time in the world i you know i work my job i'm and then i can do whatever i want uh you know but for people with um other obligations you know they have they have work like me they have families so i'm wondering how they work full-time jobs and you know and have some semblance of a social life at the same time or are they just huddled in a room uh looking at flashcards non-stop and are anti-social i think a lot of the people who come to the college are looking for somebody to guide them through it and uh sometimes that can be difficult because you it, it really is self-motivated um you know i had to uh, working 60 hours a week or something at a restaurant I had to take it upon myself to sign up for all these certification programs like the Quartermaster Sommeliers and WSET um, because I knew that if I paid for a test that that was the only way that I was going to actually learn the stuff because I'm so tired. Every time I get home, I sit in front of a book and I fall asleep or something, you know, because but but a lot of these people, they, they want sort of an avenue out of what they're doing or they want a way to if they're in the restaurant business, they want a way to make more money uh, and be more informed. Uh, when they're talking about wine, and I think that um, we really we really enable people to to take handle of that at the college, uh, but at a certain point it it becomes like your own journey as well, you know, like you have to like go out there and pay for the test and and then like have it impending so that you sit for it and pass and all that because we don't have you know there's associates degrees and certifications out there, but it's not like sitting in front of an examining body as far as like like you would do for the sommelier exams during diploma uh when it got down to you know three two to three months before test time my alarm was set at four o'clock every morning i was at the books uh in the morning at about 4 15 till about six when my kids you know through the span diploma was a a three-year process so my kids when when i started they were three and one now they're you know gonna be seven and five um there's times they were up at five thirty, six o'clock. So I had the clock, you know, at least an hour, hour and a half in the mornings. Um, blind tasting in the mornings did not work for me. So I had <laughs> those were the midnight session. So it was really burning the candle literally at both ends. You know, I was doing early morning study sessions, t- having my wife uh, blind pour me, you know, at 1030 o'clock at night and tasting through till midnight, one o'clock sometimes. So it was a uh, it was a lot of hours. Having a full-time job, having a family, I was really not able to even go into the city and, and take the classes there. So I did it homeschool and online, mm-hmm. um, which was interesting. The advanced was all home. And it's, you know, there's a lot of memorization. You know, a lot of it is just simply committing, uh, you know, facts to memory, index cards, you know, spreadsheets, charts, rewriting it, all that kind of stuff. Um, 
And the advanced was was real palatable to do that at home. First would be my W set uh, workbook. This comes from it's a British organization. Once you get into it, they send you a workbook and um, kind of a textbook that you can go through. So that would be kind of the the primary reference. There's some supplementary stuff. This is a great book. Uh, Kevin Zraeli wrote a uh, wine course called Windows on the World. Karen McNeil, a brilliant, brilliant woman, wrote the Wine Bible. Um, as you can maybe tell by the thud, it's a pretty big book, um, but very, very helpful. It's a little bit easier to read to somebody that's not in the wine industry, but there's so much just chunks of knowledge in here. It's incredibly, incredibly helpful. And in terms of the diploma, they set up a really a well thought out and organized online system where you were in a class with a hundred people and working on projects and bouncing questions off instructors. Um, so you could do it at off hours. There weren't, you know, there was, there was a week per uh, region or section or whatever it was, but it wasn't like, all right, classes at six o'clock it's classes this week. And here's our project for this week. And here's what you got to study. And here are the questions you got to answer. So it was kind of on your own time. Um, granted it does take up a good amount of time and, um, I think finding people to taste with, we're lucky, like you said, mm-hmm. to work here. Uh, but being able to, to bounce stuff off of, you know, guys like Joe and, right. and Nat Lee and, uh, you know, Sue and everybody was, Lauren is, is hugely helpful in, in getting perspective. Even if they weren't W set, tasting grid trained right. using yeah. it, just going through a tasting process with professionals mm-hmm. is amazingly uh, helpful. So I would say for people who are trying to do it, make sure you have the time, um, make sure it's something you really want to do because it's not a, Pardon my French. It's not a. You can't half-ass your way through it. Right. It's it's legit. Um, and to get some other people around you who are, or if they're not doing it, are into it. So basically, all this stuff is difficult. The tests, studying. Uh, it just uh, you know can be like it can take over your life. It can take over your world. So I'm wondering, like, is there an end goal to all this? Is there a finish line that, you know, you're reaching for? So uh, something tangible, you can be like, I have accomplished this, and now I am done. I hope there's not an end goal. I mean, I, I really, I, I do plan on getting the Master Sommelier Diploma in, in about three years, which, you know, like an 8% pass rate for that. It's not like, that's kind of like a lifelong pursuit. But... I always want to be able to travel and meet winemakers and taste new wines and enjoy food and wine pairings and learn about the the world as it changes. The wine world's always going to change, especially with climate and everything. Uh, the wine regions are going to become um, extinct to a certain degree, and others are going to be blossoming. And so you you know it's just a fascinating world for me. Um, yeah, I don't ever want to stop having to learn about it. That's that's the fun part. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> That's the big question, right? Because this could be the end goal, or there's still the master of wine, you know, possibility out there, and, and I don't know uh, is really the answer. I I feel super accomplished. Um, the feet are like halfway up. I think uh, I've I've gone to a point where I feel really educated, really knowledgeable, and I can um, distinguish myself a, a, a bit out there, you know, in talking about uh, wine and, and educating about wine, you know, and um, I'm in certain groups and, you know, it just happens. You're talking to 10 people and, oh, you know, how come this wine tastes like this? Well, let me tell you why it tastes like this. And it just, it happens because you're trained to do that. Right. Um, so yeah, I'd say the feet are pretty much kicked up unless, uh, there's some, uh, super driving force to, to step up to that next crazy level. Absolutely not. <laughs> I mean, I have a goal for sure. Um, I would like to, yeah, maybe get a master's degree in wine uh, with the W set. After you reach a certain level, you get to put the title master of wine after your name, which is really cool. But um, you can spend your entire life delving into it and only scratch the surface. There's so much out there, like we were talking about earlier, the chemistry, the topography, the geography, the, the culture. It's it's kind of a uh, an exercise in self-hatred to get into wine, but in the best possible way, because the reward is that you get to drink wine at the end of the day. At the end of every show, I like to ask folks if they have anything they want you to know that I didn't touch on. And uh, all three of these week's guests did because they're very curious, interesting people. It was a simple message about wine education and why it's important and why they do it. So what all our guests had to say was super genuine and made me think about someone entering the wine world now, uh, like where I was back in the day, and what their hopes and goals are and what they want to contribute to the industry and, hey, possibly even change it. Uh, the 
teacher in me is that when someone asks a really simple question like that, it's so easy, like you said, or I'll just be like, oh, that's so silly. But instead to turn it into a teachable, that's a great question. And you know what? When you get one person excited after a question like that, then all of a sudden their passion starts to develop. And I don't know, that's a, that's a fun part of it for me. I really enjoy that aspect. One thing I always like to talk about is, you know, people assume that sommeliers are like kind of snobby or there's this air of, of like arrogance that is associated with being a sommelier. And I really always talk about how important hospitality is how much we have to care for other people it extends to like you know all aspects of life and that's really what I try and teach I try and talk about wine as if you know we we enter into it knowing nothing right so nobody has the key to the golden lock about like the secrets of wine because it's always changing and I think it's important that everyone realize that everyone has the right to this knowledge and that it's all about fun drinking wine and the more knowledge we share the more we all get to enjoy it for the people at home, go out, drink some wine, do some blind tastings yourself, help us make it not so pretentious. Wine is there to be drank, not to be talked about. It's there for fun. So get out and enjoy it. This podcast is produced by Large Media, L-A-R-J Media. Wine Enthusiast is made possible by grapes, sunshine, and wine, and by the hardworking editors who bring you news and information on your favorite beverage every day. If you like what we're doing, share our podcast with your friends and give us a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. For more fun wine information, follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Wine Enthusiast.